Well, let's continue our study. We were talking about Romans 4, the faith of Abraham, um, verses 1 to 25. Let me read it to you again. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith has credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. For he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be credited to them, and the father of circumcision to those who do not only are of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. <clears throat> For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world as not through the law, was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath. But where there is no law, there is no violation. Some translation reads sin. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations have I made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God who gives life to the dead and calls into being, that which does not exist, in hope against hope he believed, so that he might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake, say my sake, to whom it will also be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Now, we were, we were talking this morning about, about this fact that faith, well, our Robert says this, Faith is like a tool to a carpenter. If you are a carpenter, you have a hammer. You can use that hammer for whatever purpose you need it. And, and he said, or Robert says, faith is like that. It is something that you can use for whatever purpose it seems fit. Now, for some people, the use of faith has been to uh, the fringes. 
we need money, we believe God for money. We need healing, we believe God for healing. All of that is well. But those things are supposed to be added to us. Here in Romans 4, the ultimate purpose of faith is the resurrection of the dead. And we were making applications this morning that like Abraham, he was almost 100 years old, 99 years old when Sarah got pregnant. He, he contemplated, the Bible says he contemplated on his own body. He looked at his flesh and, and boy, he can see his wrinkles. You know, he can, he can see, people say, well, Sarah was very beautiful. He was, she was not 91 years old when that happened, okay? She was a little younger. Uh, maybe around 60 or something. And, and you say, well, she, she still looked pretty. Well, who, who said that she was pretty? Number one was Abraham. So she was around 70 years old. What happened when you're 70 years old? Your eyes play a trick on you, you know? <laughs> who, who was it who said she was pretty? The Pharaoh. How old was the Pharaoh? Older than Abraham. So th those are the things that, that uh, you have to take into, considera in, into consideration. But Abraham looked at Sarah and said, you're menopause. Okay, so the body is dead. Now look at this. His faith was used to cause life to germinate in that womb. Now that is resurrection from the dead. That's, that's what it is. And the Bible says that... Uh, Actually, Abraham uh, received assurance because faith is this. How do you know you have faith? When God can say something and you believe it. A lot of people give some of the most fantastic definitions of faith. All it is is believing. Now, faith is a substance of things sold for the evidence of things not seen. Anyone who comes to God must believe that he is and that he fulfills his promise. That's what you mean by the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So Abraham was looking and saying, Lord, you know, can it be Ishmael? And God says, no, no, I promised Sarah. So God kept assuring Abraham, it's with Sarah. That repeated assurances persuaded Abraham, and it must be Sarah. The amazing thing with us is this. There are tons of repetitive promises that God gave to us in the scriptures. And today, sometimes through preaching, sometimes through, through prophecies, the Lord keeps reassuring us of those things. So if, if we have faith, that's what you hold on to. You know, you, in, you don't need to feel something. You don't need to shake, quake, or roll in, in all of the, all of those things. When, when I and I just got married, I, I, I don't have the machines. But the prop, God gave, gave me some promises. She was not aware of it before we got married. But the Lord gave me some promises as to what, uh, what the state of, <coughs> of our ministry is going to be. I, I kept it to myself because I was wondering, why in the world will I be able to do those things? You know, Some people get excited. They jump up and down and they tell everybody. That, that's not my personality. <clears throat> but then during the uh, <clears throat> wedding, <coughs> prophecy of confirmation went forth. And uh, it so happened that uh, we have a videographer, all volunteers. Somebody took a separate audio tape, the cassette tape. You know, it's, do you still have cassette tapes, guys? That's, that's ancient, that's ancient, that's ancient times. What we have now are SD cards, you know, and uh, thumb drives. And I, I played that tape in the car over and over because even though we're coming to Chicago, I was wondering how in the world is that going to happen, you know? Some people say when God tells you something, you jump up and down and... You rejoice and everything is okay. Not with me. God told me something. I, I keep wondering, how, how in the world is this going to happen? I have, I'm about to go to Chicago and I have a ministry waiting, which turned out they were just playing tricks on me. There was not really a job here. <clears throat> so we would, we would play that tape. And I would, 
My wife is so happy she was, she was new in these things. But, but me, I was reflecting back on years past as to what God told me. You know, those, those promises in the scriptures, the things that God told you is what you hold on to. And that is a faith, regardless of what you feel. Yeah, that is faith. When, 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 when God gives you a promise, it's like, it's like when, when somebody gives you a promise and that person is reliable, sometimes that person will be obsessed. I told you already. Just, just, just drop it. Just believe it. That is faith in, in simple terms. A childlike faith when God tells you something and you can, you can get hold. No, guys, look at this. Have you noticed we have lost some members already? Did you notice that? <laughs> we keep driving at what, what God told us. We're still, we're still, we're doing more missions now. We're still, now we're planning on, on a building project in the Philippines. Some people say, well, you lost some members. Let's, let's back off a little bit and, and cut back some. We're not because, because God promised. You know, we, we, we keep running. And the Lord keeps providing. And some of the things, some of the ways by which God is doing it is ridiculously simple. I mean, right now we have this inside mother permission. What in the world is that? Uh, right? I never, I never thought, I, no, I will never do that thing. You do it, you know. <laughs> That's why I, I don't want to have anything to do with it except to receive the proceeds, you know. Because I'm not going to sell and say, Mada. That's not my call, you know. Uh, Noli is going to have dance project. I'm not going to dance. I don't even know how to dance. But these are ideas that, that are according to your talents, that are percolating in your hearts. And that's from the Lord. It's, it's fine with me. You know, it's, it's to his own call. These missions ideas I never come up with. And I'm amazed on how Lion's Heart members are rallying around this vision. You see, all, all we're doing is actually moving forward to what God promised. That's faith. We, we are not magical. We are not fanatical. We just say that this is what the word of the Lord says. This, that is a faith. And sometimes you look at your flesh, you look at your age, you look at your situation in life, and you're as good as dead. And you begin to say, no, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, because you're as good as dead, so to speak. But that is where faith should be utilized. And, and calling those things that are not as though they were. Now, David has uh, his own understanding of this. Because we're talking about the, the righteousness that we have. It was credited to us. We don't earn it. You cannot do anything to earn God's blessings. We have to come to terms with this. Can you really... Can you really, uh, when Solomon was dedicating the temple, the humility was there. That was the most magnificent edifice ever built on the face of the earth. Some of the items were overlaid with gold. I mean, can you imagine the menorah? It is made out of solid gold. It's not bawal yung hinang, no soldering. That's a huge piece of gold. You know, can you imagine the kind of jewelry that was uh, the, the intricate details of the designs of the, of the temple was phenomenal. And yet when, when he was dedicating the temple, he said, Lord, uh, the earth is, heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. How can you dwell in a place like this? That's what he said. The humility that was, that was there, he, he looked, he didn't say, look, Lord, look, look what I did. No, he did not do it. God drew the plan, gave it to David. David raised the money. Solomon did not even raise the money for it. His, his father did. And so there is no way that Solomon can brag and say, 
Look, Lord, how good of a fundraiser am I? He was not good in fundraising at all. He, he did not do any fundraising. It was David. And then he could not say, look how marvelous of an architect am I. No, he could not because the architect is God. It is a, it is a picture of what the new Jerusalem is going to be. The architect and builder is God. That's what happened. And so Solomon himself cannot brag about it, you see. That's why we have to be very careful when the Lord blesses us and, and we brag. You know, because one of the things that God says is, lest you say, with my own hands, I amass this wealth. No, God is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And this is always a temptation to us. It's called pride. Look at David in Psalm 32, starting on verse 1. Psalm 32, verse 1. That's uh, verse 6 and 7 of Romans 4. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no dece uh, deceit. Now, there's, there's, uh, there are three focus on, on this one, although the main focus is forgiveness. Three, uh, three terms. Uh, forgiven, covered, and does not impute iniquity. Now, remember what, what, what we said. It was not credited to him as righteous. In Romans 4, it says... He will not take into account your sin. Meaning, if there is a log book of God saying that, uh, saying that uh, these are your debts, God remove everything. We stand, if we stand before God right now, there is no sin in our book. Now, David already understood that. Listen to this. Remember what, what I told you about the faith of Abraham? He contemplated on his own body. He said, well, I'm old. Sarah is dead also. Now, this is how David understood it. David said, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. You know what that means? God searched David. Now, very significant with David because of the famous sin of David, which is, what is the sin of David? Very famous for? Bathsheba, right? And the murder of Uriah. Now, listen to this. David, after years... <clears throat> of realizing how forgiven he was. David murdered Uriah. David raped Bathsheba and then later on took him as his wife after he murdered Uriah. How blessed is the man whom God will not impute iniquity. Now this is what happened. God examined him. Now remember the confrontation with Nathan the prophet? And then Nathan gave him a parable. There was this man with multiple number of sheep and his neighbor only had one sheep. When, uh, when the guest came, he ended up butchering the sheep of his neighbor. And David says, who is that man? I'm going to make sure he pays. And Nathan looked at him and said, you are the man. To impute something means there was a thorough investigation. There was a thorough investigation on the allegations against you, somebody said that Erwin had a hundred million dollars that uh, <laughs> that he stole, and so investigation was done, and through bank transfers and wire transfers, it was discovered some so many accounts were really wired illegally to his account, and he amassed a hundred million dollars. And so, as a judge, I will say. This, the missing one million dollars is on you. I'll put it on you. Because there was an examination. You know what uh, faith for forgiveness is? God looked at David, and really he was the murderer. And really he was the rapist. Really he was the one who was guilty of all of this. But then David went to God and said, God, forgive me. And God says, Although I found you guilty of all of this, because you asked for forgiveness, I will not impure it against you. That's what forgiveness is. Meaning God did not overlook our sins. He knew we sinned. He knew it. 
But then, because we ask him for his mercy by faith, and we look at him and say, Lord, I believe that you can forgive me. I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that Jesus covered my sin, took my sins away, in fact. God says, because of that, you believe in what Jesus accomplished for you. I will not take this against you. That was the prayer of Jesus on the cross. Lord, do not, do not lay this charge against them. That was the prayer of Stephen when he was being stoned. Do not lay this against their charge. Do not impute this on them. That's what it means. So are we guilty? Yes, we are. But God says, I will erase this from the book. It will not be found in the book. You have no sin at all. That's how David understood. As early as the Old Testament. That was already the method. So the law does not really put David in judgment. When you put your faith in God, that's what happened. And verse 9 talks about that, the blessedness. Now, with this, let's transition to Paul's next point, the issue of circumcision. Because now if that is the case... How come every Jew has to be circumcised? Because the, the Jews now, especially during the times of David and Solomon, boy, they are, they are proud. We are the circumcised. You know, during the height of the Davidic Empire, and whenever Israel is uh, powerful, we are the circumcised. They are very proud. But then the moment, the moment they are defeated, they try to undo the circumcision. So now circumcision became a mark of Jewishness. Paul asked the question without giving an immediate answer. Is this promise for the circum... Was this righteousness given to Abraham before or after the circumcision? The logical explanation of, uh, of Paul is this. He said, no. He became righteous before he was circumcised. Therefore, Abraham was already righteous before he submitted himself to circumcision. Righteousness did not come after circumcision. So when people say, if you argue that you become righteous because of circumcision, it's a false argument. Now, later on in some of his writings, he will say, who are the real Jews? Not those who are circumcised in their flesh, but circumcised in their hearts. Now, remember what, what, uh, what circumcision is from what we read? What's the other term for that? It's, it is what? Circumcision is what? A sign or a seal. Now, what happens when you get born again? You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. The moment you get born again, is spiritually, you were circumcised. You see... How, how did it happen? By faith. So now all of us who are, who are born again, whether culturally circumcision is acceptable or not, all of us are now circumcised. Now listen to this. If the circumcision is the seal of the old covenant, who gets circumcised in the old covenant? What kind of Jews? Huh? Who gets circumcised in the Old Testament? The Jews. What kind of Jews? Don't, don't think deep now. Okay? The male Jews. <laughs> right? The male Jews. <laughs> okay, because I'm I'm telling you this is this. The male Jews, now listen, in the New Testament, who gets sealed with the Holy Spirit? Everyone. Who gets circumcised spiritually? Everyone. So now, the wall of partition, being a woman, is not discriminated already. Because it seems like there is discrimination in the Old Testament. Well, there is not, but that is the perception. That's the problem of sin. You know, do you know that today there are still people who don't believe women should become pastors? Yeah. They could not get over it because of the Old Testament. But now in the New Testament, it's clear if circumcision is the seal in the Old Testament, how come everybody is sealed now? Because everybody is equal. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free, male or female. You see? 
we become equal, not only in the sight of God, but you cannot say anymore, well, you know, only as male can be circumcised, females cannot. Well, you're circumcised in the heart now. That's why you don't say, well, I'm going to go back to, to the Old Testament. The reason why the sacrifice will be offered once again uh, before Jesus returns is because that's how the Jews think. And God gave the law. And finally, when Jesus returns, he will say, I am the fulfillment of that law. That's the logical uh, presentation. Timing is very critical. Those who claim that circumcision plays a part in the justification, Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. Translation in our time. You know, we, we, we do good works after we get born again. Again, our mind flashes and say, look how, how spiritual I am. I do these things. Again, in the times of Jesus, I fast twice a week. I pay my tithes. Those things does not justify a person. Why do we pay our tithes? We explained it this morning. Because it's God's share. Everything belongs to him. You know? Remember that uh, the husband of uh, Abigail, because he was very rich in the parable that was mentioned in the New Testament, he threw out David and said, I... I, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I'm not going to give you anything. And David was furious. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to destroy you. And Abigail went with the gifts and said, My Lord, please don't do this. My, my uh, husband, uh, Nabal, is just uh, foolish. Don't do this. Don't do this to him. You see? That is, that is the state. If, if we don't submit to God's word, it's foolishness. You see? And so we do that because we are of the people of God. Now, if you, are, if you want to become a citizen of America, you pay taxes. Or, or if you're a citizen, you pay taxes. You pay taxes because of the benefits. I mean, we, we can see it. In, in the Philippines, you wonder, where, where's the taxes going, you know? Uh, one of the biggest budget that we have for decades is in the armed forces. And yet, we don't have the armed forces developed. So the citizens are complaining. But at least, you know, there, there's corruption in America. But at least in America, we, we see our, our roads and bridges are being repaired. And, and we see our armed forces being very powerful. You can see the, the result of taxation. Now, the same thing with God. God says, well, I'm blessing you with these things. I'm blessing you with these things. I want my tithes. That's why there, there's this tremendous thing that, that you have to learn of all the lands on the face, face of the earth, why in the world did God give the land of Israel? It's most precious. Well, one, one of the things is this, is, it's really a, a very fertile land. You know, there's a lot of volcano there, a very fertile land, you can grow anything, but it needs water. It, the early and the latter rain are literal. That's why the God that that area worship a lot is Baal. Because God is the God, Baal is the God of rain, he's the God of fertility, he's the God of harvest, that's Baal. Well, God put Israel in that land. Why? Because it doesn't matter how prosperous the land is, they have to keep believing God for water. If God does not send rain, no harvest. And so when God says in Malachi 3.10, I will open the windows of heaven, it's the same as I'm going to send rain. Now what is our livelihood right now? Let me ask you this. What's our livelihood? Do we plant? Any farmer here? We work. So how do you apply now I will open the windows of heaven? We don't plant. Huh? Yes, opportunity for your work and your skills. Exactly. Because when God says, I will open the windows of heaven, what God is saying, I will make sure that during planting season, you have the rain so the plants will germinate and you can make money. It will grow. I will make sure that, that the latter rain comes so that your harvest is plentiful. What is God saying to us? No matter where you are, if you are faithful with your tithes, I'll open the windows of heaven. You will have opportunity to use your skills. You will have opportunities to make sure that you make money, that, that you can be hired, all of these things. That's the equivalent of that, you know. If you are faithful. That's what God is, is, is saying here. But, the people of Israel were already in Israel. 
they were not going to be transported to Israel. They were already blessed. They were already a chosen people. We are already blessed in our state right now. It's up to us whether we will be faithful to him, but we are already part of the community of faith. And that is the clarification that he was, uh, he was giving there. The uncircumcised, though, became late arrivals. Look at Romans 11, verse 17. Because then evangelism took place, and now the people of God in the New Testament start fulfilling what God has been wanting in the Old Testament. And that is to share the gospel. So as it is right now, listen to this, from what I just explained to you. You and I, we are already blessed. Say, I am blessed. It's not that we're, it's like God already put us in a promised land. Now that promised land requires rain, okay? But we are already there. And God said, if you pay your tithes, I will open the windows of heaven. Our faithfulness or believing in God is what will determine how far we will go, whether we will continue to have harvest. You see, if, if you obey, now I've always had my harvest. You know, I came here with, with no, as a tourist, I ran out of status. And uh, my skill is I'm a preacher. I can also work with my hands. I, I'm a carpenter, you know. I can do some, a lot of things. But God has always given me opportunity, you know. I, 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 everywhere I go, God gave me opportunity. I went to Virginia Beach. And I wasn't even invited by the pastor, Bishop John Jimenez, the late one. So I just went to his office and said, Bishop John, I was just wearing a T-shirt. <clears throat> it was fall. I said, I'm a pastor from the Philippines. I came here to volunteer. I would like to uh, volunteer in this church. And I, I remember what Bishop John Jimenez, you know, he, he was big. Just opened his arms, wearing his suit, and said, Hola, Jose! Me casa, es tu casa. Es, es tu casa. And, and, and my house is, is your house. And the guy just, just hired me. <laughs> I said, okay. Okay, I need somebody in the international ministries. Be, be my associate there. You know, that's, that's how it was. I, I, never, I never lacked the opportunity to use my skills. Always. So, some, some preachers have a problem where, where they're going to preach. I have no problem where, where I'm going to preach. You know, I remember one, one day, Bishop called me in his office because I was already staff. And he said, Jose, somebody in the accounting office, I, I don't do that here, somebody in the accounting office brought to my attention uh, for the last several uh, Sundays, you have no, 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 no money given to the church. Are you, are you a tither? Oh, I felt sad. Because my, my pastor, my bishop, confronted me. I, I felt sad. I said, I'm very sorry, Bishop John. I said, but if you will look back, you will notice that I give bulk of money every 10 weeks. So he, he checked. Why is it? He said, I have no income. <laughs> I said, after the quarter is over, I go preach, and you will notice I give a I give few hundred dollars after that. He said, yeah, but that's in the record. He said, that's my tithe. I said, I don't split my tithe. You know, some people split their tithe. I said, that's my tithe. I don't want to be able to spend it. So the moment I arrived in Chicago, in, in, in Virginia, because I said, whatever offering I receive from those things, I immediately tithe. I said, now, on a weekly basis, some people give me money. Sometimes some people will give me $50. Some, sometimes people will give me $100. I said, I tithe in cash. I said, my, my, my mistake is I don't put my name. I said, from now on, I'm going to put my name. Oh, that clarifies it. You, see? You, you know why? Because if I'm not a tither, immediately I will no longer be an associate minister for Bishop John Jimenez. Meaning, the windows are closed. But wherever I go, I've, I've always had uh, employment. Why? Because the windows are open. But I'm already in the promised land. I am already in the promised land, so to speak. I am, I am utilizing my skills. I'm utilizing my talent. God is giving me harvest. I mean, even, even in the Philippines, 
I go there, I, I minister all the time. They, do they give me love gifts? Yes. And, and, I'm, and I'm trying to compare. At, at one time, there's this little church. I told you this. I'm amazed. All, everything, of course, goes to mission. And uh, <clears throat> you, you go to the Philippines, you preach. They'll give you 1,000 pesos, sometimes 2,000 pesos. I, this pastor has been wanting me to preach. And I, I've always said, no, because I want, I want a day off because I teach for three days, you know, uh, almost a whole day. So during Sundays, as much as possible, I don't want to preach. But this guy has been asking me. So he asked Brother Willie, can you please ask Pastor Seth if you can please? Finally, you, you get tired saying no, and you get embarrassed. So I said yes. So I went and preached. The guy gave me 18,000 pesos. I was surprised. I said, I, I think this is the opening of the church for a couple of weeks or something. But, uh, but gave me 18,000 pesos. Why? Because the windows are open. That's, why, that's my skill. That's the gift. Now listen, if you're a nurse, if you're a PT, if you're a salesman, whatever your job is, you be faithful to God. God will make sure that the windows of heaven are open for you. My wife never applied for a job and never get accepted. And finally she said, well, I cannot, I cannot be employed because, she told me, because of you. Oh, she blames me. You always need me. I said, well, that's part of the package deal. So I, you know, you know when, when some of our people are leaving, you know what I told my wife? You go find a job. But I told my wife, find a job in the travel industry. I said, why travel industry? So I'll have free tickets. <laughs> because I never intended to break our promise in the Philippines. I'll go for missions. So at least... At least the transportation is taken care of. I said, even if I cannot bring a team, I'll just go there and, and teach. I said, uh, and, and see what will happen regarding the rental of the places. But that was our intention, just to keep using the skills of God. But she said, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to go to, there was immediately an opening. She can go to, to Minnesota and, uh, in the airline industry and have work there. I said, it's not going to work. But she's always hired. So she looked at this old lady and, and, and said, I'm going to take care of you. She gave her a house. Huh? Did you hear me? A house. <laughs> now, of course, we're not praying for her to die. But the moment God takes her home, you know what the thing is? That means at least a minimum of $400,000 worth of house. Because I, we refuse for her to go to, to normal employment. But God says, I have opened the windows of heaven. I'm going to take care of you. Huh? Are you listening? That's how God does it. And so you be faithful. But remember, you don't earn the blessing. No, no we don't. Now, my wife goes there and says, Whoa, sweetheart, I better take care of this blessing. I don't want to anger Elizabeth and, and pull out the, the inheritance. So I, I said so. Are you, are you really going to come for a mission? He said, well, the Lord bless us because we're doing missions. I'm going to missions. So every time she goes to missions, she breaks Elizabeth's heart. Yeah. She hates it when Anne goes to missions. But you know what Anne says? I'm going to missions. Not only is she going to missions, I'm going to bring her to Israel this, this February. She's going with me on Texas this January. Why? Because we are living in our promised land. And God opened the windows of heaven. Amen. If you're living by faith, God will give you opportunities to make use of your skills. That's why joblessness is not an issue for a person who walks by faith. Are you listening? Your, your employer will, will say, well, I want you to, to do the following things. And say, no, no, that's against my faith. You're going to get fired. You, cannot, you just think you're the boss. God is my boss. God will always use, give me. Well, the windows are open. And so the opportunities are also going to be there. So a believer does not worry about his job. Amen? A believer does not worry about his job. One, my, uh, my, my wife was telling me, my, my kids gave some, some offering, and they, don't, they, have, they have a little bit of money. Why? Because, you know, they have a little bit of money. 
one, one, one of my, my, my kids gave uh, this amount of money for missions. And my wife looked at me and says, look at what, how much he gave. You know? Because they live in a house who tithe and give often. You, you, you love God. You value God. And God sends, sends you somewhere to do something. You, you think he will look at you and say, I'm going to let Jose starve. I'm going to see how skinny he can get. Uh, I would like his, his rib cage to be showing because of his soul. God is not like that. He opens the windows of heaven. And he blesses you. Amen? Why? Because you are in the promised land. Do not let the devil deceive you that you need God to bless you. He already blessed you. Everything that you touch is blessed. Now, get, get that concept in you. Everything that you touch is blessed. Now, now some of you are, with my wife, are uh, rallying to come up with ideas on how to raise money for missions. I don't rattle my brain how to come up with money for mission. I, that's just me. I just don't. What will happen, pastors, if there's no money? Then there's no money. That's not my vision. It's from the Lord. He's got to finance the thing. That's why when that project is finished, I have no right to boast. I could not even stand and say, well, you see how big my faith is. I cannot do that. Why? Because it's God's grace. Amen. I've got five kids. I can't even boast I've got five kids. Why? Because in normal, in normal economics, I shouldn't be having five kids. Yeah. But I welcome the blessings. And now I've got five kids. And, you know, they're, they're a joy in my life. You know, the, the, the big ones are already gone. Joseph is going to, I don't know. He hurts me, you know. He can't wait to leave the house where he grew up. I mean, he just wants to fly away. That's why he's joining the Air Force. But at least I've got two little ones still, you know. Uh, I've got, I, st I still got DJ close by. I think John just wants to go somewhere. I, I don't know what's wrong with that boy. You know? He always wants to go away. But I still, can you imagine if I, have, I only have one, 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 one Joseph and he's leaving? Man, that's going to be very lonely. But the windows are open, so I'm, I'm rushing him, get married right away. I told him, if he doesn't get married, I'm going to find a wife in the Philippines. Yeah. I already found one. Yeah. <laughs> she, she, had, she had pictures with me and my wife. I said, if you don't rush, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab this girl and, and all you do is by email, I do. You know? And that's it. <laughs> because I want, my, I want my grandkids, you know. I want, I want my grandkids. She's, he said he's going to join the Shaolin Temple and be a monk. <laughs> but, uh, but the Lord is good. The windows of heaven are open. Therefore, the only response that I can possibly have is, is be faithful. So now God talked to Abraham and said... <laughs> This is going to be the sign of the covenant. All male Jew born on the eighth day will be circumcised. Now, that's a commandment, right? Will be circumcised. How old was Abraham? Not eight days old. A <laughs> hundred years old. But you know what, God, what Abraham says? I volunteer. He got himself circumcised. Who do you think circumcised Abraham? I don't want to know. <laughs> Man. Hey, come here. Yes, boss. I obey God. Circumcise me. What? <laughs> no way. <laughs> you know? But he volunteered. I reckon he doesn't need to be circumcised. And then the males in his house do the same thing. You cannot force any of them to be circumcised. When you are old, nobody can force you. I hope you guys understand that. The moment you are old, you've got to submit your will and say, I volunteer. They all volunteered. 
None was forced. Why? Because they are already in the household of Abraham. Now, they are eight days old. They have no choice. Their father uh, volunteered them. That's like, a, like, like our kids when they're growing up. They have no choice. They have to go to church with me. But now that they are old, they had their choice. And the uh, one who complains all the time is Joel. Why do you have to be in church all day? Then, then go home. No, all of you are in the church. Then, then <laughs> yeah, but, but now, now Joseph has, has a choice, and he used to be here, and, and, and DJ, and all of those, and, and I want that, that attitude to continue, that behavior. That's why I, I don't like it when, when people are so casual about coming to church. Don't be too casual about it. You are in the covenant. You know, you are, we train our kids in the fear and knowledge of God. And so my kids are used to it. They, they come to church. They, they, they like coming to church. And Joel, you know, he may not like. Earlier during the youth service, Joel was running in, the, in my office. You know, I, I like to take a nap, but the door keeps opening and I keep waking up. So, yeah. Joel just rushed. Bam! Before I can say hi, he was out. I, I look at him. You know why he was out quickly? Because the service is going, he took his Bible. He wants his Bible while he is in the service. That's Joel. Yeah. He asked me to buy his own Bible. So I bought that Bible for him. Why? Because the attitude is developing. And I will nurture that. I will never discourage my... I'm only talking with Joseph where he will be stationed. Where I, I said, well, I'm probably going to see... Well, there's a, big, well there's, there's a good church there where you can go. I says, okay, you'll show me, Papa. I said, of course I'll show you. I'm not, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be Lion's Heart, you know, unless he pioneers Lion's Heart there, you know, so. And, and uh, retire early and become a pastor or something like that. But uh, you have to cultivate the thing because we are already blessed. I am already blessed. You are already blessed. What is left for us is to walk in that blessing. God already pronounced blessing on our lives. Whatever we touch, get blessed. Amen. Amen. So whatever you guys touch in faithfulness to God is already blessed. Whatever call you have is already blessed. Romans eleven seventeen. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you being a wild olive, you see some, not all, you being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant, what, what was arrogance this morning when we say about arrogance? It's illogical boasting. Remember that? It's illegitimate boasting. That's arrogance. Now, this is what Paul is warning us about. Some of the branches were broken off. When, now, the branches were not cut off. So if, if there is a tree and there's the branch, it was broken off. When that branch was broken off, it gave room for the wild olive branches to be grafted in. Who are the wild olive branches? Us. Now, some people say, well, you know, those are Jewish, they're super blessed. Well, listen, how many roots were there? One root, Jesus Christ. And so when this branch was broken off and we were grafted in, we are receiving the same nutrients as the branches that were not broken off. Because some Jews, blindness in part happened to Israel. Some of them are, are born again. The apostles were born again. So now, we were grafted in. If the tree is Abraham, of course the tree is Jesus Christ, and he is the root also. If the tree is Abraham, there is no separate tree, one tree. We belong to the commonwealth of Israel now. That's why in Galatians, the blessings of Abraham now belong to you and me. Oh, look, look, look at the people. Of, they are the envy of the world. I look at the nation of Israel, the tiny little nation. I, I want to walk in their blessings. They touch something, it makes money. 
They are the most intelligent people on the face of the earth. You know who financed Second World War? J.B. Morgan, Jewish. Yeah. Started basically the bookkeeping system for America. America borrowed money from, from J.B. Morgan. And J.B. Morgan says, okay, I'm going to put this financing together to finance Second World War. And by the way, that's this what's going to happen. After the war, you're going to pay me. And that's what, how it, can you imagine the whole Second World War of America was financed by a Jewish man? I look at that and I say, boy, I want that blessing. You see? It's from the same root. That's why the moment you get born again, the same blessing of intellectual excellence now belongs to us. No, let me go. Amen. Huh? The same intellectual blessing. You know how smart the Jews are because they're blessed? That's how smart you should be. Now, that's why when, when I make demands, our kids should belong to the best schools because that's part of the blessing. You know? That's part of the blessing. Whenever DJ comes and says, you know, I, I did not do well in this, in this quiz or this in this exam. Well, you're supposed to do well. Why? Because she is blessed. Huh? But our minds are so enslaved with our past. Well, you know, my, my mom did not finish college. My dad did not finish college. But you are a child of Abraham now. You are blessed. You, are, you, you have this intellectual blessing that God has given to you. That's why you should not be scared of studying. I'm not scared of studying. If I'm younger, I'm going to get me another degree, a couple of degrees more. Should not be a problem. Why? I'm a child of Abraham. You know, the last degree I took was supposed to be six years or seven years. Took it in two and a half years. Yeah. I, I tried to hide it. Took it in two and a half years. Why? Because I am more blessed now. I'm walking in the blessings of Abraham. Got some books there that are very difficult to, to read. I really believe I can read them. And I do read them. We have the blessings of Abraham. Our children, can you imagine you should be, you should be praying for your kids going to school, Lord, bless my, my son, bless my daughter, that he will be an intellectual giant in, in, in the university. But the problem is sometimes our, our kids go to school and they come, oh, it's very difficult, I got I to gotta see Oh, because, you know, sometimes people make this bad comment about, about, about uh, my, my family. Yeah. They say, well, you know, Sister Anne, your kids are smart because look, look at the parents, you and Pastor Jose. That's a lie. Yeah? The reason why our kids can, can compete in the academic world, they're blessed. They're blessed. They're born again. They belong to the same tree, same root, same nutrient. Your kids, you should be blessing them, pronouncing, confessing, calling those things that are not as they were. Call to life those dead brain cells. You know? Those dead brain cells live. <laughs> you know? How do you know they are dead uh, cells? Because they are getting Fs. Dead. Call those things that are not as though they were. Alive. F. In Jesus' name, turn into A. Amen? I really believe these things. I believe that my grandkids, my children serve God. My grandkids will be intellectual giants. I really believe that. They, they'll, be, they'll be excelling in schools. That's part of the blessings. You should be pronouncing them. We are now part of the, of the family of faith, of the family of, of Abraham. This clarifies to us also that circumcision is actually not sufficient to qualify people in the household. You can be circumcised all you want so many times. It will not bring you the family of faith. You should already be in faith before you can have the blessing, before you can have the circumcision. So, so in the same way, we cannot earn God's blessing. Oh, I, I look to God and I 
pray to God on a regular basis. Help me understand this. Yeah. Uh, sometimes in my prayers, I could not pray anything anymore because I don't know how to pray. I pray in tongues. Lord, help me understand this. Help me understand what it means that whatever I touch is blessed. I don't fully understand that. Wherever your foot steps, that's yours. Can you imagine we go to the Philippines and, and we say, I step here. That's ours. That means whatever missions we do is blessed. Can you imagine you came up with the idea of, uh, of dance? You don't just say, we're going to have a dance. You say, I step in here. This is mine. The devil has been using that to glorify Satan. But you step in there and say, this is mine. Somebody wants to bake. You know that was the most expensive donut in the world? Huh? How much is it, Aunt? $50 per donut? The most expensive donut in the world is in New York City. Something like ridiculous, $50 per Are you going to pay $50 per donut? <laughs> it's being bought in New York, $50 per donut. You know who bake it? A Filipino. Yeah. He put some edible gold in there. Have you, have you eaten edible gold? I did. Why did I eat it? I just want to try it. It's, it's in a pastry, expensive pastry. But boy, it's gold. You know, it's so, so tempting. I got tempted. So, so I bought it. You know how it tastes? I forgot. Yeah. But I just want to try it because $50 of donut. Oh. It's a Filipino who, who came up with that. Yeah. Can you imagine somebody come up with the idea? Uh, what's this thing that she announced? Enzyme mother. I hope there's no gold in there, you know. But you step in there, this is mine. That's why some of us are, are, are dancing, are tiptoeing. Because we, we don't know what that means, that wherever your footsteps, it's yours. Of course, you can't take it literally now as this, this land is mine. No. Not literally, because that's a different promise. You can apply it now. Whatever work you engage in, that's yours. And, and you can dominate that thing. You can rule that thing. We Gentiles, who are now part of the household or the commonwealth of faith, does not understand that yet. That's why we worry. You know, you've got that, how do you call that thing? Uh, caldero, you know? <laughs> Dominate the sale of that thing. Amen? Huwag ka lang magtindo ng caldero, pati kawali, yeah. Pati kawa, lahat na. You dominate that thing. You know that sometimes in the sales business, they'll buy because not of the product, but because of the person. And even if they're buying the same product, they want to buy it from a certain person. Like I go to Betty's and Nick's for my haircut. I don't go there for haircut. I want Jay to cut my hair. If Jay is not there, I don't get my haircut. I go somewhere else. Why? Because of pride. That's all it is. Jay is my barber. Do other barbers there cut differently? No. They cut the same way. But I don't know why I like Jay. Because he's got lollipop, yeah? Yeah. But that's what it is. Can you imagine if people, say, people will say, I'm going to buy this caldero. Okay, I'll, I'll say, no, no, I want Nikki. Why, what's with Nikki? They don't also know, but we know. I mean, she is shorter than them. <laughs> but, but why Nikki? Because she is blessed. Because she is blessed. Huh? Yeah, can you imagine Ann is taking care of this old lady? She wants Ann. The insurance people come, I don't want to talk to you unless Ann is here. That's why it is. You've got to be able to claim, this is my blessing. Amen? And the windows are open. Right there. You're still thinking, what in the world is he talking about? I'm talking about you guys and your jobs. 
In verse 15 again, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is no violation. What ends up happening is actually the law ends up bringing wrath because we violate all the time. Therefore, if we keep violating it, we cannot be blessed because we are following the law. We are, we are blessed because of faith. I, I've learned this. <clears throat> you know why, why school is important? In school, you don't just study. That's where you find contacts. People don't realize this. Be friendly in your school. You know, don't, don't put down anybody. You don't know what that person is going to be doing in the future. I've, I've learned this. The moment you begin to hire, and you can read this and, and listen to executives say this, the moment you begin to hire in the upper ranks, so you need an executive, right? And you need these educational qualifications. At, at the highest level, everybody's qualified. Yeah. You've got 100 applicants. The salary will be $10 million per year. You have 100 applicants. And you look at these resumes, they are all impressive. You know what it boils down to in hiring? Relationship. Willie told me that when he got hired by TIPCO, the boss was, was just upset. Everybody steals from me. Everybody steals from me. And Peter, his brother-in-law, said, well, boss, what are you looking for? I need somebody with integrity. I need somebody with character that I can trust. And Peter said, well, boss, there's only one person I know. And that's Brother Willie. And Brother Willie told me that when he worked for TIPCO as, as a vice president, he said, I was the most unqualified person. Of course, he, he ran businesses before. But he said, among the applicants, I was the most unqualified person. You know why he got hired? Because of relationships. That means we live our Christian life. And, and it shines as a testimony. In the future, people will be looking for, for uh, new employees. What if your classmate became a president of a company? And they say, I need somebody whom I can really rely on. All of these applicants, they're all the same. And then they think, I've got a classmate in high school. He's the most honest guy I know. Everybody pushes me around. He comes to my, to my rescue all the time. They're going to look for you. And you know how, use your head a little bit. You know how easy it is now to look for you? Exactly. You Google it. You go to Facebook and they find you. They find you that quick. And then they're going to contact you and say, are you, are you in need of a job? That's what happened. That's why, you know, in, in college, you don't stop anybody there. You don't put down anybody. Be nice. Be, be personable. Learn that these are the things that in the future could be open doors for you. These are the things that works right now, especially in this day and age. That's why you can claim wherever you step on. You go nursing school, that's your step. This is mine. Dominate the thing. You want to be a school teacher, you dominate the thing. You want to be in the insurance industry, you dominate the thing. Because the windows are open, you're blessed. You're a child of Abraham. Amen? And he is the father of faith. And it's through faith that we can be part of it. You can't earn it. Now, this is also why faith in the resur resurrection of Jesus becomes important. Now, Abraham looked at his body and Sarah's body and said, they are dead, and said, I believe God can bring back to life. So God resurrected the womb of Sarah. Now, you remember this, okay? Isaac is the seed of Abraham, not the seed of God. That means that Abraham and Sarah has to sleep together to produce Isaac. The resurrection was not only on Sarah, but on Abraham. I'm at 100 years old. How can you have sex? You die at that age having sex. <laughs> he has to be resurrected also, right? And Isaac came. 
So Isaac was not supposed to be produced. So now when Isaac was uh, a young lad, God says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. That's why he has no problem offering him. Because he was not supposed to be there. You know what Abraham said? If God can resurrect my body, he can resurrect Isaac. That's where his faith came from. That's why do not undermine the things that God is telling you on the early years. If God tells you in the early years, you believe God for a tuition on Bible school, like what I had. Because God can provide for my Bible school, he can provide for my seminary. Because he can provide for my seminary, he can provide for further education. Because he can do that, he can provide for my family. It all starts with little things. And so when God tells you to do something, you go do it. Because that is the root and foundation on faith operation. And so what happened now? Therefore, God has to send his son, Jesus. And we have to believe that God raised him from the dead. That's why, this is the point I was telling you earlier this morning. That's how you call things that are not as though they were. Jesus said, nobody takes my life. And by the way, I'm taking it back. That's the faith of Abraham. Right there. And so when, when you begin to look at yourself, you say, well, I'm old, I'm late, I, I can no longer fulfill my dreams. Well, you, you call those things that are not as though they were. Some people are hesitating and say, well, I'm, I'm too old now, I can't have a house. Why not? Resurrect the thing. God can give you cash. God can give you favor. Well, it's too late for me now. No, it's not too late. That's where you use your faith. Well, I could no longer study. Why not? If I'm not this busy, I'll go back to school. But again, the, I actually inquired in one more school. I was gonna, it's going to be easier for me to get another degree. So I inquired in 420 Indiana. And the admission director there told me, Sir, I, I received your credentials. Why do you need another degree? I got embarrassed. <laughs> he said, she said, you don't need another degree. Just get seminars here and there. He said, you don't need another degree. They won't even accept me now. You know? But I actually inquired. Because, you know, people will say, well, you're, you're too old. I can still handle it. That's my piece of plan. I can claim that. And so what I do now is just study here and there. No, no fear here. I, will, I told Anne after I finished my last degree, maybe I can still go back and study law. I really, need, I really want to study. You know what my wife told me? Go do it. Take law. I said, easy for you to say. You're just saying yes. You know, I'm the one going to school. But I, I really feel that. That's my domain. I can, I can, I can reign there in that area. That's so why there should be no fear. Are you listening? You are a child of Abraham. You are a child of God. Wherever your footsteps, that's yours. Don't say you're too old. Bring that thing back to life. Hallelujah. You know? 